and buried in dust and ash. My name's Paul Cooper, and you're listening to the Fall of Civilizations podcast. Each episode, I look at a civilization of the past that rose to glory and then collapsed into the ashes of history. I want to ask, what did they have in common? What led to their fall? And what did it feel like to be a person alive at the time, who witnessed the end of their world? In this episode, I want to tell one of the most dramatic stories to come down to us from the ancient world, the rise and fall of the Empire of Carthage. I want to show how this city rose out of the Phoenician states of the Eastern Mediterranean and set out on voyages of discovery and settlement that put them at the centre of the ancient world. I want to describe the unique culture that flourished on the shores of North Africa, And I want to tell the story of how the city of Carthage was destroyed and its memory nearly wiped from the earth. The Mediterranean Sea is a vast body of salt water that lies between the continents of Europe and Africa. It's by far the largest inland sea on the planet, stretching around 4,000 kilometers from end to end. And in the west, it's connected to the Atlantic Ocean by a thin opening at the Straits of Gibraltar. The coastline of this sea is more than 46,000 kilometers long or enough to wrap around the entire circumference of the planet. And this coastline has provided a home to countless cultures and civilizations over history. One of these cultures emerged on the easternmost corner of the Mediterranean coast, on a stony stretch of shore in what is today Lebanon, overlooked by towering mountains covered in cedar forests. Here, a series of city-states rose up more than 4,000 years ago that would give rise to a culture that would one day be called the Phoenicians. The largest of these cities were named Tyre, Sidon, and Byblos. Pinched as they were between the waves to the west and the forested mountains to the east, the territories they ruled over were never large. But this relatively isolated geography also meant that they were somewhat protected from invaders. The people we now think of as Phoenician wouldn't have ever used that word. Phoenician is a term invented later by their great rivals, the Greeks, and it's unclear if these cities ever thought of themselves as a unified people. They had a common Phoenician language and were united by the worship of certain gods, among them Baal Hamon, a heroic god named Melkart, and his wife Astarte. But there's very little in the historical record to suggest a common identity, architecture, or literature. Even the Greek word Phoenician has a somewhat mysterious origin. In the earliest texts, such as Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, the word Phoenike is used to describe a particular color of purple or crimson. And it is also used to describe a date palm, possibly due to the reddish color of its fruit when ripe. And so it's possible that the word came to be used as a result of one of the Phoenicians' earliest and most successful industries. The Phoenicians of Tyre and other cities were the first people to color their clothes with a particular kind of dye, derived from the bodies of predatory sea snails, known as the murex, or rock snail. These snails produce their dye as a defense mechanism against predators, 
and depending on the species, can produce a vivid red or purple color, quite unlike anything else available in the ancient world. From the moment these dyes were first used by Phoenicians, around the 16th century BC, their colors became immediately sought after. But the process of producing these dyes was difficult and costly. It could take more than 50 kilograms of these snails to make a single gram of dye. And so these fabrics were extremely expensive. The color purple would soon become associated with enormous wealth and as a consequence with royalty. This color would be known as Tyrian purple after the Phoenician city of Tyre and later imperial purple. It would dye the robes of the emperors of Assyria Rome, and later Byzantium. The first century Roman writer, Pliny the Elder, writes about the effect this color had on anyone who saw it. For purple, the rods and axes of Rome clear a path, and it likewise marks the dignity of boyhood. It distinguishes senator from noble, and it is summoned to secure the favor of the gods. It illuminates every garment and on the triumphal robe, it is blended with gold. But why the price? It's possible then that the term Phoenike came to be used by the Greeks to describe these traders from the rocky coast of Lebanon as the makers of purple or the purple people. The name 